All right, let's turn our attention to Prop 2. Um, we have uh, we've had some committee work on this. We have our public hearing scheduled for this evening. Um, I think we have the logistics worked out for how to do a hybrid public hearing. So some of us will be here present in the room and will be on room view, uh, which is similar to what folks who are following along from the outside are seeing right now. Uh, others of us <clears throat> will be planning to take the public hearing uh, remotely. And, um, and so we will, I think, take the time to introduce ourselves as committee members at the beginning of the hearing, since some of us who are sitting here physically in the room will only appear as tiny little dots. And I, you know, I want to make sure that folks know, um, you know, that mm -hmm. they have the attention of the House of Ops Committee and who we are. Um, so we'll take a few moments just at the beginning to do that. Um, I will give my regular spiel about, um, about how to participate in a remote um, public hearing uh, in the same way that I have done for previous public hearings. And, um, and we will hear from all of the witnesses. And um, if anyone shows up in person, we will, we will of course hear from them here in person, but I believe everyone who has registered has registered to be remote. Um, any questions on the logistics for this evening? Excellent. All right. Um, so let's have just a few moments of committee discussion on the substance of the proposition. I. Um, I want to make sure that if there are any other perspectives that that committee members want to hear from, in addition to our required public hearing this evening, that we get those people in to testify. Um, it would be my intention to do that tomorrow at one o'clock, right after the floor and our training tomorrow, so that we can um, vote this out to the floor. Um, tomorrow afternoon before we uh, adjourn for the week. So other perspectives, other um, individuals that folks would like to hear from in order to help inform our consideration of Prop 2. Representative LeClaire. Um, have, and I'm just sort of to jump all here, have we had any other constitutional, I guess, experts um, we've had what a professor teach out a, a few times, right? Has there been anybody else that's weighed in on it from that perspective? Do we know? Is there anybody else? That... Well, I'm trying to think of who we heard from two years ago when this proposition came through two years ago. And I, off the top of my head, I don't think of anyone who falls into the category of a constitutional expert. Um, <clears throat> Let's give that a moment to um, to do a little bit of research because I see Representative Gannon is already. <clears throat> Representative Anthony. Is it possible, Madam uh, Chair, that Paul Gillis testified as he uh, has done a considerable work on the evolution of the uh, history of Vermont since uh, uh, colonial times, if it were? Uh, it's certainly possible to ask him to testify if that's the will of the committee and if he's willing and able. Okay. Sure. It, this isn't a, a huge issue for me, but I just I have to say, I found it interesting um, that the professor had acknowledged that he's vacillated back and forth on this. And, and I'm just very curious to know and again, if we can't, I totally understand that. Um, Let's have a committee discussion on that, actually, because I found that really interesting because I, I recall two years ago, he testified for a similar amount of time, um, uh, it, you know, with the history of, um, you know, a great deal of history about, uh, about what the early days of 
Vermont looked like in terms of um, slavery and indentured servitude um, and came to the conclusion that it was a good thing for Vermont to clarify. And this time it, he, um, he seemed to be of the mindset that, that preserving this for historical reasons in order to hold on to this idea that Vermont was the first or only state to um, prohibit slavery in its constitution seemed to weigh out in his mind. And um, I don't know, I mean, happy to have a committee discussion about that. I mean, he did say regardless of his personal beliefs were some, I don't know, I didn't hear his testimony two years ago, but maybe his testimony two years ago came more from a personal than a professor speaking. Uh, help me remember committee members who were here two years ago. He, I thought it was him and not legislative council who went through a fair amount of history and showed, um, showed actual historical documents of mm. advertisements that mm -hmm. you might yes, see in the newspaper around bringing, uh, bringing people into indentured servitude, mainly European, uh, you know, people who really wanted to migrate um, would look for indentured servitude as a path to do that. Um, and it seemed two years ago, if I'm remembering correctly, that, uh, that, that he essentially said that there was some of this that was happening under, you know, sort of under the radar in Vermont, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we had a constitutional mm -hmm. um, prohibition against slavery. Representative Hooper? Uh, I'm appreciative of Representative Anthony's request. Uh, Gil is, is a, a good resource. I am, I've developed since this convention of states thing hit the skid so uh, fervently that any fooling around with the constitution is uh, not the first place you should go, but whether this is of substance or just window dressing, I think it's something that we should address because um, we should be very clear that slavery is not. And that's sort of my position. Thanks. Any discussion? Representative McCarthy. I, I was a little taken aback uh, by Professor Teachout's implication, and I, I don't want to read too much into what he was saying, but what I took away from it was some desire to not uh, have us cast the founding the founders of Vermont as people who supported slavery. And to me, it, it's like the defensiveness of the history doesn't make sense. So in, if you, what this comes down to for me is if our constitution is a living document and it's a reflection of our most fundamental values as a state, then we have to have the text reflect those values and evolve over time and clearly indentured servitude was okay with <laughs> the, the people who founded Vermont. I mean, that's very clear. And it's very much not part of our values today. And that's why, you know, I am a strong supporter of making this change and having Vermonters have the opportunity to, to vote on it in the fall. But um, I, I just, the, the thing that was really jumped out at me was this this kind of attitude of defensiveness. Like we needed to protect the legacy of the people who founded the state. And I think by changing our constitution, that we're, we're always gonna have the historical documents. We're always gonna have access to the evolution of the constitution over time. But the, the document that we have, and that's the foundation of who we are as a state, you know, I, I think it's gotta reflect all of our real values and this, this is part of that evolution. I, I was really taken aback by that defensiveness. You know, I, I don't see history that way. So I recall a senator having that position mm -hmm. two years ago, and that he may have been the only member of the entire mm -hmm. General Assembly to vote against the, the mm -hmm. constitutional amendment. And mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I agree that taken aback is a good description of 
how I felt about that. Other committee discussion? Yes, Representative Colston. Um, for me, um, the most important piece of his testimony was that the proposed language will um, remove the ambiguity that's clearly in, in the Constitution at this point. So it, it makes it very clear in terms of the new language. And he actually supported that. He said that that, that, that would be fine if that's what you want to do. So I think it's the clarity of the language that has really come to question. And I think that's why we need to support the proposition. Here is the list of everyone who testified two years ago in the mm -hmm. House committee and in the Senate committee. Um, Paul Gillies is not on that list, but I've asked Andrea to reach out to him to see if he might be available to share his thoughts on the history of our constitution. Representative Anthony. I'd like, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to go a little uh, further than my colleague from uh, Winooski. <clears throat> I think uh, Peter Teachout was pretty clear also to say that as long as the original language is present, it uh, at least invites, or I'll put it in my terms, gives a platform to people who frankly uh, don't deserve a platform and who actually harbor some regret that indentured servitude is not still available. Uh, I don't frankly want to give a platform or an ambiguity to people who actually uh, hold on to that particular aspect of Vermont history. And for that reason alone, I would urge that we strike it. Representative LeClaire. <laughs> I have to ask the obvious question, I guess, based on that statement. Is there anybody today that points to that language and says that it's okay, that slavery is okay or forced indentitude is okay. I mean, can anybody give me an example of that? I know this is gonna go through and I'm not advocating that it shouldn't, but uh, you know, I think that there's a fair amount of conjecture around things like that. So I think that one of the people who testified the other day, um, and I'm not remembering his name at the moment, was um, making reference to forced work in the context of the prison system as a form of slavery. And that to the extent that people who are incarcerated are required to work, are not paid a of you know a living wage for their work or that other people are able to profit off of their work is a form of slavery and um and i and i guess you know when you look at it just purely on the surface i i agree with that i i agree that somebody who is not paid a fair wage is required to work as a as a um as a person who is incarcerated and who, for whom profit is made off of that labor um, is not fair and should, should be prohibited. I, I respect the opinion, but I very much disagree. <laughs> but that's why we're in this body. Um, I don't look at somebody that's being incarcerated for the reasons that they are being required to do something as, as I, I, I struggle to equate that to slavery. Reasonable people can disagree. They can. Representative McCarthy. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the reference to indentured servitude and the clear prohibition in the, the language in Prop 2 also removes the ambiguity of a question like this around you know, labor in a prison, right? Because you might not consider it slavery, but it is an indentured, in my opinion, a form of indentured servitude. And we're saying in, in Prop 2 that, that, that's, that in any form of indentured servitude is prohibited. And I, I think other, other people have been proponents of us taking this step and changing the constitution this way you know, have talked about you know, other forms of labor that is either, you know, it, that's not compensated or is um, 
compensated in a way, you know, like, you know, I think of people who uh, are advertised to come here, whether legally or illegally from other countries, and then are often compensated with housing and, and other things, but don't have a kind of fair wage. And so I think that we're sort of setting a bar and saying that, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to put people in this position in any form and make it very, very clear. Um, so this is getting kind of complicated pretty quickly for me here. I, I thought we were just talking about the letters on the page. And now all of a sudden I'm hearing that there's so much more that's going to get brought into this discussion. Sounds like it could be quite quickly. Um, you know, because I guess you're, you're talking about people that come in to work in dairy. Um, I'm hearing about prisoners. Um, for me, I thought it was kind of cleaning up the language, but I have to say it, it, it concerns me to hear that it's being portrayed as something so much larger for so many other issues. And I'm not going to pretend it doesn't trouble me so. Representative Hooper, then I see Lefebvre and Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I think maybe we're looking back on ancient history with uh, a, a lens that is sort of focused on where we are today. Uh, there's a big difference in my mind between slavery, where somebody shows up on your shore, runs up, grabs you and throws you on a boat, than somebody who says, I want to go to America and I will work for you for two years at a reduced salary. It's sort of like the apprenticeship program we have today. Um, and, you know, if you drive from Colchester to Milton, you pass something on the left that is called Poor Farm Road. Every community used to have the equivalent of, I don't have any money, you know, this is what I have to do. Um, it, it gets complicated when you get away from the clear slavery issue, I think, and maybe that dilutes what we're talking about here or confuses it some. Um, slavery thing has to go, has to be clarified. I don't know the, the difference in the indentured servitude or those sort of things, uh, which were much different in South Carolina than they probably were in Vermont. Um, it's going to get resolved, but you know, we're, we're hobbling ourselves, I think, to some degree by looking back from our own perspective here. Thank you. Um, Representative Vihovsky, um, I am noticing yesterday and today that your, uh, your hand raise in your square sort of appears to kind of disappear in the background of the white on the house chamber walls in your virtual background. <clears throat> and I'm just wondering if you might change that to a yellow hand or a blue hand or a purple hand or something. I, I don't want to miss you in the queue because I didn't notice that you had your hand raised. Um, so I'm going to go to Representative Lefebvre she and can, then Higley and then I'll come to Vihovsky. She can, or someone else can go first. I'm still thinking about it. I first. just raised my hand, so you didn't miss me. Okay, good. Um, Representative Higley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, this discussion for me too has. Uh, uh, brought up some concerns. Um, I certainly heard the um, representative from the Vermont Law School talk about uh, if um, the uh, Constitution is changed, the wording that is being proposed is is the correct wording. I, I was reassured uh, with his statement in that regard, but. Uh, I mean, if we're going to go down this whole road of uh, looking and considering um, prisoners that do certain work as uh, indentured uh, servitude, uh, I would have to have a, a better knowledge of, uh, of some of what prisoners do, because my knowledge of what some prisoners do is not for the profit of somebody else. It's for uh, maybe uh, uh, cutting and splitting wood for low-income families. Um, so, so again, uh, I, I have a real concern and, and, and not completely knowing uh, what uh, prisoners in the state uh, are required to do or asked to do. So if we're going to go down that road, I guess I need to have some more testimony uh, in that regard. Well, let's, I, I'll be clear that I'm not, I'm not implying that, that I think that, that this change uh, in the Constitution is 
going to have the effect of law of saying that uh, that our prison system has to change what it's doing currently. I'm I was reflecting that the person who testified, um, what is his name? <laughs> headphones on. Yeah, oh. he had headphones on. He was sitting in a dark I think background. It was Reverend, Reverend Thomas. Um, no. no, no, it was the, <clears throat> the, the guy Reverend from guy. New Jersey. Right. Um, running the national program. Yeah. Um, Max uh, Parthas. Max Parthas. Yeah. He he was saying that um, <laughs> that prison labor is a, is a form of slavery, and and so um, well, everybody has a right to, to say what they personally feel. But again, you know, what is it, what does it come back? How does how does that get you know drawn through the processes or through the courts that, that would finally make that determination? I mean, yes, there's nothing about this that would instantly outlaw something other than slavery or indentured servitude. And I don't think that, you know, I think that there would have to be more um, <laughs> more legal process to uh, to drill down into the forms of work that people in prison are subjected to. Sure. Uh, Representative Bihovsky. Thank you. The, to clarify what I recall um, Max Parthas saying is that forced prison labor is a form of slavery. Um, and, you know, I think any anyone should have the choice to work, but it should be a choice. It shouldn't be forced. They should not be unable to, to if, if they've moved here, unable to leave because of the wages they're making don't ever allow them to leave. It's, it, it should be a choice. And, and so for me, it, it, that was the piece really here is, is the choice. Are we forcing people into slavery or indentured servitude? And the words on the page are, are pretty clear that no, we don't agree with that. And I think the nuance, we, we could have a long conversation about the economic realities. And, and, and I think those are bigger, deeper conversations that aren't, as the chair has said, immediately going to change. And by the by us declaring clearly and, and firmly that slavery and indentured servitude is wrong. I guess I'll just state my, I totally disagree with that comment. If, if you've got somebody that's incarcerated and you have expectations on them to do something, that again, that we're gonna make the comparison or the analogy between slavery and that. Um, I totally disagree with that. Senator Colston and, and then- uh, Thanks, Representative Madam Wilson. Chair. Just, just for some clarification, um, our US Constitution, the 13th Amendment reads, neither slavery, nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place such to their jurisdiction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Lafay. Um, So I just wanted to, I guess, recap from the, the different things that I've from testimony that we heard and from today, you know, things that people are like throwing out things like apprenticeship. And when we heard testimony, there was things of like a, a bigger agenda. And for me, looking at this, when I first saw it, there was no question like, yes, this is something that I support. Like, I don't want anyone to ever think that they can hold somebody or make them do work or, you know, ever imprison somebody. Like that, that's not what we do here. Um, they, that's not allowed and we will not tolerate that. But I don't like hearing the things of, you know, this is part of the bigger agenda. This is part of where we're going to move on from. And this is what we need to do like as a stepping stone, because for me, I don't take this lightly. This isn't like a stepping stone. This is something very big and something that we should, you know, be proud of what we're doing. And so that, that makes me bring pause to, is this something that's just a check box and there's a bigger area they're trying for, you know, that there, other people are trying to get to through this, or is this something that actually is going to be done? And then there's going to be changes to things that possibly could be going on here. You know, people said things like apprenticeship. People are, have to do something to get somewhere and they're not paid a wage. You have to go through, you have to work and you don't get something. Like you're not getting a wage, you're, you're following through. But you're choosing to be an apprentice is the difference. Like I'm gonna choose to, to apprentice to a, an electrician because I wanna become an electrician and, and I am willing to work for free or for, 
you know, for very little wages because I want to learn the skills, right? And so, so I, and to, and I, I hear that, but I also hear the same thing of the same thing of in someone being in jail. And I know Rep. Colston just read the amendment again, but the testimony we heard, someone chose to do a crime. You're in jail. Right. And he was quoting from the United States Constitution. Yes, yes. Yes, no, and I understand being asked to change no. the United States Constitution. <laughs> no, I, I understand that, but, and I, and I, I, I understand that, but from what we heard from testimony, people already seem to have a, a trail they are following. And I think that's probably true for everything that we do, right? Every, every bill that we pass through here, somebody else might think, oh, great. Now that they've done that, I want to I wanna do a little bit more. You know, now that we've eliminated this, eliminated this board or commission, I want to eliminate the next one, <laughs> you know? So like everything that we do, it, somebody else might be thinking of ways to build on it. And I think the question that we have before us is, do we think it's right to move this constitutional amendment forward? This is not the be all end all, like we are not adopting this constitutional amendment. All we're saying is we, it can advance to the next step in the process, which is that the full house considers it. And then it advances to the next step in the process, which is that it goes to the governor and the governor puts it on the November ballot for 2022. And then the next step in the process is every Vermonter gets to vote on it. And so, you know, we may, we, you know, we could get bogged down in a lot of the details and a lot of the thinking about, well, what does this mean? What, you know, what, what more might happen at some point in the future? Um, but the reality of the question that's before us is, do, do we believe that we should put this forward for the House to consider, for the governor con to consider, and for Vermonters to consider? And I respect that, and I respect the process, but I don't take very light to what we are doing when we are changing our constitution. And for me, that's something that is a very big deal, and I don't appreciate it being a check mark on someone's agenda, regardless if that's the truth or not. This is something big that has affected, you know, and it personally has moved people in the room and people that were testifying. Um, and it, to me, I just didn't appreciate that. Well, I mean, I'm sure everyone at this table has gotten emails at the beginning of the session about various policy organizations or lobbying groups that have legislative agendas um, that they want to get passed. And, but, you know, you know, I think the question for us is, you know, is this the right thing to do is amend the Constitution? I really don't think that leads necessarily to a larger policy discussion of some other things that may or may not happen. I mean, I think it's, this is, is an issue in and of itself is whether we want to amend the constitution to clarify um, the intent, um, our intent with respect to slavery. Whether there are other policy issues involving racism is, is a separate discussion that will be dealt with in potentially other pieces of legislation. And we will have a debate about those issues that's separate and apart from this. I, I don't see this as, you know, oh, if we pass this amendment, it's going to lead to X or Y. I, don't, I, I really don't see that. Um, but, you know, others may disagree. I mean, everybody has an agenda that comes into this building, I mean, and wants things from us, right? Yep. Well, I have an agenda, but it doesn't seem to be gaining too much speed. <laughs> I don't know if Representative Cannon was was talking about us all having an agenda. I was not. <laughs> I think he meant many of the people who come and testify before us. But, <laughs> well, we're being all on shoot, we all got agendas. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is really true to one degree or another. <laughs> Other committee discussion? Representative Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just reflecting um, even a limited view uh, over the 100 years of the um, 20th century and the various amendments that have come and gone. I, I, uh, I think think, for instance, the, the um, 
widening the franchise to um, persons who are not male. Uh, th that uh, movement started at least 50 years prior and maybe more. Uh, universal franchise, citizen or no, had been practiced in states and localities for a very long time before we actually, as a people, were able to vote to officially change the constitution to uh, support um, the franchise in uh, federal general elections uh, to um, women. And I, I, I don't recall, uh, but I could be wrong, that people were lamenting the loss of some historical uh, gem. Uh, they were treating it as simply a, a revision to match current thinking and current practice uh, compared to 1791, uh, when that original language was first agreed to by a bunch of white males uh, <laughs> under the Articles of Confederation. So I, you know, this, this sort of goes back to the, what does the constitution represent? Is it, is it a sort of dead document or a series of dead, dead uh, articles? Or is it meant to be um, uh, brought along with the change in our society? And I, I guess I'm part of the living document crowd. And so I don't lament that it was changed in the 20th century. And I, I, I know if I want to look at the original document, I know where to look for it. And I can also do, as Peter Teachow did, understand the context in which the original language was hatched. Um, but that doesn't bind me as, as, I, as I get a sense that some people are sort of um, uh, stuck in, in a, in a, uh, in a well, we can't change it because it was important in 1791. Uh, I, I just happen not to be part of that uh, mindset. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Andrea informs me that um, Paul Gillies is able to make himself available, which is really fantastic. Um, I love that he has the flexibility and he will be here um, momentarily. I hesitate to give us a, a bio break lest we um, impolitely leave him sitting here alone in the room for 15 minutes. Um, but Andrea, if you have any other clarity in terms of when you think he'll be here um, that might allow us to, to go off live and grab a cup of coffee or stretch our legs, um, do let me know. 